Zach Smith here with Fiorentino Perinker. Today we're in Monterey, California at the start of the Great Pacific Ocean Rowboat Race. This is a race where rowers will row from Monterey all the way to Hawaii, which just takes incredible toughness to do such an event. They are also likely to deploy a parachute sea anchor or storm drove. A parachute sea anchor is an underwater parachute that's deployed off the front of the boat to help drastically slow the drift of the boat and more importantly keep the bow faced into the seas. Now the only time an ocean rower is going to deploy a parachute sea anchor is simply because they can't row into the wind, so you might as well deploy the equipment, uh, keep from losing too much uh, mileage, and get some rest. Now the second time an ocean rower will deploy a parachute sea anchor will be simply because it is just too dangerous to be on deck. You're, you're talking you have severe weather and I have met with many rowers that have deployed this equipment in tropical storms and you, nobody's going to be rowing in 30 foot seas. Uh, another device that rowers will commonly use is a storm drogue and they will frequently carry at least two different sized drogues just because they want different uh, slowdown capability when they're deploying the equipment off the back of their boats. Uh, for example, if I'm running downwind and I'm going really super fast, my boat will start zigzagging. Sailboaters have this issue too. Your boat starts wiggling around all over the place. Well, if I deploy a drogue, it kind of straightens me out a little bit and, and slows me down. So for calmer weather conditions, if, if uh, some, for example, some of the uh, open uh, rowboats have a tendency to wiggle around a little bit, even when we're heading in, in, into the wind. So they'll just want to deploy a small drogue to slow down and straighten them out a little bit. They don't want to deploy a great big one because if it slows you down too much, well, heck, you're just going to have a harder workout. For many years now, I have been going out on sea trials with these uh, ocean rowers, just trying to see what works and what doesn't work when we're deploying this type of equipment, and try to come up with some kind of uh, ideas, tips, information that will make things a little bit more simple for, uh, for deployment. This video really is about just showing basic uh, tips and information, which will really help maybe you make some decisions on how you're going to set up your equipment, just to make things a little bit more simple. Ocean rowboats all have eye bolts on the front of the boats themselves, not only for trailering, but it's also uh, where we attach a tether line to the front of the boat. Now this tether line is normally 12 to 15 feet in length and is stored in the cockpit of the boat. Uh, this is to avoid having rowers go on the front of the boat to attach their deployment road for, for deploying the parachute itself. Now the lines that Fiorentino normally make up will use a tubular webbing to cover the rope to protect it from sun damage, since rowers are going to be out on the water for a long period of time. Sun does uh, beat up rope rather quickly. Now the conventional method of deploying deploying a lot of rope with a parachute sea anchor is typically over 300 feet. This kind of mirrors uh, what sailors and, and power trawlers do when they go long distance. They carry a lot of rope on board to deploy for storm use. But if it's in situations where we're only talking about gale force conditions, we can end up with a lot of slack in the rope itself. And when you have slack in the rope, the parachute starts to collapse and then the boat will swing sideways. It's a very uncomfortable motion that also can generate a lot of shock loading. Now, one way of alleviating that problem a little bit is to add bigger parachutes at the end of the line. Well, the bigger the chute, the more water it grabs to create tension on the line. But that doesn't work 100% of the time. So Fiorentino's road tension method is to add actually a little bit of chain. Usually I will deploy three to five pounds of chain that's attached at one end of the rope, the other opposite end is attached to the hardware of the parachute itself. So if there is slack in the system, the chain will sink and help keep the parachute inflated. Okay, this reduces the amount of lag time uh, that the parachute could potentially you know, collapse. Because we want to keep that bow facing the seas the entire time. We do not want to fall ball, uh, a beam too. Now, Fiorentino has done all kinds of rigging setups where we'll cut rope into segments, meaning that we'll have 50 feet of rope and then another 250 feet of rope separately. A lot of our rowers have, uh, after we've trained with them, have preferred to just deploy the 50 foot rope in order to cont uh, maintain continuous force on that rope, which keeps the parachute inflated. Because the shorter the length of rope, the more it starts to act like a cable, basically, which will keep your parachute inflated. And then at that point, you really don't have to mess with chain. Now, if you're a single-handed rower, this might be an easier way of deploying the parachute sea anchor versus always deploying 300 feet of rope. Because in the deployment of these parachute sea anchors, one thing that a lot of rowers are doing is attaching 
uh, trip lines that are usually about 25 feet longer than the actual 300 feet of rope that's deployed with the parachute anchor. That's a lot of rope to manage. Now, if you're a crew of two or more, you can have one person deploying anchor road while the other is de deploying the trip line itself. But when you're a single-handed rower, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because what we want to do is avoid having trip lines wrap around the nylon rope in a parachute. That is somewhat of an issue. What helps a little bit is to add some flotation to the trip line itself. The floats are normally uh, attached about 25 feet away from the top of the chute. At least that's what Fiorentino, that's how we've been rigging the chutes uh, for a very long time. Now, to kind of get back on the subject of the boat swinging back and forth, whether you do the conventional method of deploying longer lengths of rope or preferring to go the Fiorentino's road tension method of deploying short lengths of rope, or adding chain uh, to the parachute system. There is another option that we can consider if we're doing a bow deployment from an ocean rowboat. Now, the tether I was talking about earlier, the 12 to 15 foot line that's brought back into the cockpit area of the boat, is a straight on head to wind deployment. Now, if the boat starts swinging back and forth, we could grab a spare line, a dock line of some sort, and uh, uh, tie it off. We can do a rolling hitch, uh, we can do slip knot, all kinds of ways that we can just go ahead and just slip this rope over the main rope and go ahead and we can heave to, basically set up a bridle setup. And some of the boats have cleats uh, on the front of them that permit you to heave to, others do not, but it's something that you may want to consider, something you want to practice with. Parachute sea anchor deployments are off the bow of trawlers and sailboats, for instance. But with an ocean rowboat, uh, you can actually deploy parachute anchors off the bow or the stern, depending on the design of the boat itself. Some of the boats have a tendency to swing stern to the weather, so this might be an option for deploying the parachute sea anchor. You will have to rig a bridle on the back of the boat. Many of these boats have eyes where they can do that kind of setup. Everything else remains the same. Just like a bow deployment, you're gonna use the same length of ropes if you decide to add the uh, road tension method of a little bit of chain at the end of the rope itself. All those remain the same. My name's Justin Atkin. I'm a boat builder from the UK and I work quite closely with the designer of these boats. And um, I can explain a little bit of the theory as to why um, we would want to anchor these boats from the stern as opposed to the bow. Um, that's not saying that anchoring from the bow is a no-no, it's just you've got another option of the stern. Um, so, we've got an aft hatch which accesses all the areas to the, um, to the bridle which you'd attach your power anchor to. And a little locker here that's been built onto the back, which is a new development for this particular boat, to actually keep all your anchoring lines, your drogues and your power anchor um, on board. Um, first things first is take the rudder off of course because all the water that's it's going to be um, backing up on the stern and of course coming over the cabin um, it's quite exposed and uh, yeah the surface area of that uh, would generally cause the gear failure <laughs> um, so you can lash your power anchor, power anchor onto here and deploy it and the boat will sit quite happy like that um, the main reasons for that was that a you've got this fairly large cabin here which is pretty tough but also affords some shelter over the, the cockpit area so for getting in and out you're not just coming out and facing the seas that are coming over the deck um, but also as well because these boats uh, have got sort of the classic long keel design when they're actually tracking down waves all they want to do is go in a straight line they've got like this tail fin area um, here like you'd see on an aeroplane <laughs> Um, when the boats are in storms and they're surging against the power anchor and the line's going slack, sometimes when these are from the bow it can start actually wanting to actually drift back and go down the wave again and of course that can start to cause snatching against the power anchor. Whereas we found from the stern, when it surges against the, the rope and the rope goes slack, it then comes back in a straight line and grips in again. And so we found that actually it was a more comfortable ride <laughs> to, um, to deploy from the stern. Now one of the things that um, um, that you've got to think about with this particular um, method of anchoring is that if you're locked off against it on the power anchor um, if you're not careful the only way you've got to actually um, collapse the chute is by opening this hatch and that's pretty much the last thing you want to do when you've got waves coming down on the stern so what we've got here is a little fair lead which will take the line forward to the cockpit so you've actually got the option if you have to 
of just opening the forward hatch, pulling the, and collapsing the chute line, and then you can actually pull most of the para parachute actually up to here, and then of course the boat's moving again, you're not locked off against it, and you're not going to have so much breaking water landing on the deck. And of course you can just row off with it, hanging from the back if you want to as well. Sometimes in a pinch, if we don't have any hardware pieces to attach our parachute system to our anchor rope or trip line, things like that, you just have to make do with what you have. So one real simple not to use for attaching equipment to a parachute sea anchor or drogue, for instance, is a simple bowline knot. You just create a little O shape there, right? I'm going to run through it like so. And you pull that tight. There's your bowline knot. Okay. It's a real nice, strong attachment point. And if you've got a little extra tail left over here, you can use some duct tape, something like that, to help make it a little bit stronger. I can show you real quick once again. I form my little O. Run to the back side. I'm going to go around the deployment road and back through the hole. Okay. That's my bowl and knot for doing quick attachments. If I don't have any stainless hardware to attach my rope to my parachute sea anchor or storm drogue. Additionally, let's just say for whatever reason you're under massive stress, you, for the life you cannot remember how to do a bowl and knot. You can't remember any kind of knot. We can all do this one. Run it through one time, right? Like so, we can all make a knot. Simple little not like so. Leave a longer tail than I did right here and I would do about two or three of these and then duct tape this. Duct tape really works very well. I learned that when I was working with the Navy SEALs and we had a bunch of scuba gear split on us. Those guys just started bringing out all this duct tape and I go, wow, that stuff really holds up nicely. So duct tape your end here and now at least you have a temporary attachment point until you can get sorted out later on. are many types of roads and hardware pieces that we can use to uh, uh, outfit our parachute sea anchors and storm drogues. Many of you will be familiar with those parts like a shackle for example. This is a bow shackle with a screw pin. Uh, we also have setups that are jaw on jaw swivels that allow for a little bit of spinning action with the hardware and also uh, snap hooks uh, that can also be used. Okay, But if you're going to use a spring gate hook like this you need to make sure it's really heavy duty. It can withstand roughly 7,000 pounds of force. If you use something that uh, only is a few hundred pounds of force, they have a tendency to tear apart very easily and break. So I try to avoid these really uh, cheap and expensive uh, type of pieces of hardware. Now, if you do have a screw pin uh, with your shackle, probably the best thing to do is to have a setup where you have a little bit of a leash on the pin itself. So that way, if you want to detach your parachute sea anchor or trip line portion, it's a little bit easier because you can actually remove the pin and then you know you don't lose it if you accidentally drop it. Uh, you can also use plastic ties like you see right here to go ahead and secure the pin itself to the shackle portion of it, but then you will have to cut it every time you disconnect it from the uh, anchor rope itself. What I'm finding uh, during our training exercises is if we keep everything separated, keep our anchor road, our deployment road separate from our trip line and our, our parachute sea anchor when it comes time for deployment, it's a lot easier to handle all the equipment. Uh, so normally the trip line will go in the water first. We'll pay out all of the trip line until it's completely uh, completely deployed. Uh, a lot of times I will add 25, uh, uh, a float 25 feet away from the top of the chute. And once that trip line is completely deployed, now we can go ahead and start dropping the parachute sea anchor into the water, uh, deploy it about 20 feet away from the boat, and then snub it a little bit so it pops open. We don't want to have our parachute floating for a real long period uh, on the surface, uh, just, to, just, just to avoid any potential tangles. Then we go ahead and pay out all of our anchor rope from there. Now a trick when it comes to packing anchor roads, when we were doing some training the other day, I noticed a lot of people were coiling 
their deployment road. And anytime you uh, coil your roads and just kind of put them in a bag or, or set them aside in the cockpit of your boat, it, it's very easy for ropes as they're coming out really quickly to snag or loop up or create knots uh, as it's being deployed. And that happened frequently to a lot of our trainees that were practicing using this equipment the other day. So the easiest approach really is to go ahead and flake your roads back and forth inside the bag itself. It can be any, any kind of bag. You can use any kind of deployment bags. It could be a, a, a duffel bag, a, a, a string slip knot type bag. Just flake everything back and forth. And when it comes to the, your poly ropes, this is a stiff uh, type polypropylene floating rope. I, I prefer the soft braid uh, poly ropes. Anything that's really kind of soft is much easier to pack than stiffer anchor ropes and trip lines and so forth. Things to consider when you're going to rig and set up your equipment. My name is Vicky Otmani and I am on team Fight the Kraken and this is our lovely boat right here, Sedna, with my rowing partner Megan in the background and luckily yesterday we had the opportunity to get out and practice testing out our sea anchor and our drogue. Um, the conditions weren't ideal for testing those out uh, but we did have a little bit of a breeze and we got to deploy the drogue and see what that feels like to retrieve it. We got to deploy the sea anchor and hammer out a couple of little issues that I was having with making the right connections together. Um, and the best part was that I had Megan with me so that she was able to actually row the boat in the direction we needed it to go to be able to deploy both of those things. So having a partner definitely helped and it was great being able to practice. I love to practice things in general, just to have run throughs so you know if any kinks are gonna happen, where they're gonna happen. Um, and just having that comfort of knowing that we've done it at least a couple of times before we're actually in a stormy situation where things can get dangerous, you're exhausted, you're stressed out, and you might make some bad decisions, not even realizing that they're bad decisions. So yesterday I really appreciated getting to do that, even though I was frustrated at the time and cursing up a storm, but it was just venting, you know, a little bit and, you know, a little bit of our exhaustion, but yeah. We, uh, we enjoyed it and it's been something that I've been worried about because really that's the only part of the trip that I know we're gonna have to use, well hopefully not, but know we're probably gonna have to use it that I hadn't gotten to run through and wasn't super confident on. So I definitely appreciated that practice. I'd like to thank Race Organizers for their support during our on-water training event. Thank you for watching.